Before we start our lesson, let us put ourselves in the loving presence of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Are you ready to pray? Let us pray. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you for the opportunity to study and prepare for a good life in the future. Bless our teachers who inspire and guide us. Bless our parents who work hard to support us. Bless our classmates and all the people who care for us. Bless us, help us to be more attentive, patient, and diligent to understand the lessons that our teachers teach us. Bless our beloved country that we may have unity, peace, and prosperity. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good day, students! Welcome to Science 7 class. I am Andensi Ganamos Lariba, your science teacher for this school year. You are about to begin an exciting year as you investigate the wonders of science. You will learn about the world, the diversity of matter, the interaction of the living world, Okay, we are about to begin our lesson, but before that, please be ready and prepare the following. In this session, we will describe the components of the scientific investigation. Specifically, you are going to first describe the different science process skills, second, apply the scientific method, and the third one is appreciate the scientific attitudes possessed by the scientists. Investigation is a part of science. It is how scientists do research. Scientific investigations produce evidence that helps answer questions and solve problems. If the evidence cannot provide answers or solutions, it will still be useful. It may lead to new questions or problems for new solutions. As more knowledge is discovered, science advances. But bear in mind that we are using the same skills as I respond to the different problems. But before going to the scientific method, let us discuss the science process skills used by scientists in doing science. Observing It is a basic science process skills in which you make use of your senses to gather information about the things and events around you. Through your five senses, you can identify the color, texture, size, taste, or odor of a material. You can take note of the conditions and the changes taking place around you. To aid you in making detailed observations, you may use a device like a magnifying glass, a microscope, or a telescope. There are two types of observation. First is the qualitative observation. It is a descriptive details about an observation using the five senses. Imagine yourself coming home from school. You see a pitcher of pineapple juice inside your refrigerator. The pitcher feels cold as you grasp it. You drink the juice. You smell the pineapple and enjoy its taste. Can you identify the senses you use in the situation? Yes, when you saw the picture of pineapple juice inside the refrigerator, you use your sense of sight. And when the picture feels cold as you grasp it, you use your sense of touch. And when you drink the juice and enjoy its taste, you use your sense of taste and when you smell the pineapple juice you use your sense of smell second is quantitative observation it involves collecting of data that can be quantified 
and we may use different measuring tools. Inferring It is a logical interpretation of your observation based on experience or prior knowledge. For instance, when you drank the glass of pineapple juice after coming home from school, you observed that it was cold. You could infer that it was prepared and placed in the refrigerator earlier that day, or you might think that it had just been made using cold water and ice. The only way to check which of your inferences is correct is to further investigate. Predicting It is making an educated guess about the outcome of an experiment or an event. It is also based on observable facts, trends, and patterns. After drinking a glass of cold pineapple juice, you left the pitcher of cold juice on the table for a few minutes. You drank another glass of juice and noticed that it was not as cold as the first glass of juice that you took. You predicted that if you would leave the juice longer on the table, it would start to get warm. So you decided to put the juice back in the refrigerator. Classifying It is looking for common attributes that can help explain how things are related. When you classify, you need to observe first the objects or events that are to be classified. For example, when you open your refrigerator, you notice how the different food products are arranged. There is a place for meat and frozen foods, for bottled products, for beverages, for dairy products, and for fruits and vegetables. This is how food products in the refrigerator are classified. Remember that when you classify, you group objects or events for a purpose. Measuring It is determining the size of an object or the amount of a material with the use of measuring instruments. Measuring gives a quantitative observation. Analyzing It is breaking down your observations into their components and seeing the relationships among them. When you analyze, you look into the details to discover essential features. To do this, you have to look for patterns in the data and recognize what the data mean. For example, if you used a thermometer in observing the temperature of the cold pitcher of juice on top of the table and recorded the temperature every minute, you would have noticed a pattern that showed increasing temperature process skills. It is communicating. Communicating is the sharing of results of your experiments or research to others. Could be a written text, symbols, or oral discussions. And that is all about the science process skills. And now let us discuss about the scientific method. Scientific method, it is a step-by-step -step process of solving problems. Let us discuss one by one. First, identifying the problem. A problem may be a question resulting from observations or experiences. For example, you grow several potted carnations in your garden. You are curious why they produce only few flowers, though you apply the best kind of fertilizer. You notice that you have placed them in an area where sunlight is scarce. You wonder if your potted plants are receiving the right amount of sunlight. Your problem may be stated as follows. Do carnations need much sunlight to produce many flowers? And the second step is formulating the hypothesis. A hypothesis is a temporary answer to a problem. It is an idea based on prior knowledge, research, or previous observations. It is a prediction that may be tested and may lead to the right answer to the problem. Now going back to your carnations, your hypothesis could be carnations need much sunlight to produce many flowers. Okay, and that is for formulating the hypothesis. Now that we have already a hypothesis, it is a time to test 
our hypothesis. To verify a hypothesis, you must conduct a series of tests called experiments. You must plan an experiment to find the answer to the problem. In a well-planned experiment, variables must be determined. Variables are factors that affect the results of the experiment. There are three kinds of variables are included in the experiment. The independent variable, the dependent variable, and the controlled variables. The variable that is changed in the experiment to see its effect is the independent variable. The dependent variable is the factor being affected by the independent variable. The controlled variables stay the same all throughout the experiment. In the problem, do carnations need much sunlight to produce many flowers? You can conduct an experiment in which the independent variable is the amount of sunlight the carnations will receive. Suppose you choose from your garden 10 carnation plants that are almost of the same size and condition. You can place 5 carnation plants in an area where sunlight falls mostly during the day and let the other 5 remain in the same area where they are. Thus, you vary the amount of sunlight that the carnations will receive and determine how this change will affect the plants. The dependent variable in the same problem discussed above is the quantity of flowers the carnations will produce after a set period of time, like 2 or 3 weeks. The controlled variables are the factors that should be equally applied to all the plants. In this experiment, you need to make sure that the type and richness of the soil, the kind and amount of fertilizer, and the amount of water given to the plants are the same. In this experiment, the carnations exposed to much sunlight represent the experimental setup. The setup on which change is applied. The five other plants that are left in the same area where they are less exposed to sunlight represent the control setup. The setup that is used as a standard for comparison. Next is gathering and presenting data. In every type of scientific investigation, data must be collected and organized carefully. When data are organized, they can be analyzed and interpreted easily. This could be done through the use of bar graph, line graph, or a pie graph. In the experiment on carnations, you can graph time versus number of flowers for each setup. Assuming that this figure shows the actual data gathered from your experiment. Do these graphs confirm your hypothesis? The answer is, of course, yes. Since the graphs show that the carnations in the experimental setup yielded more flowers than the carnations in the control setup when the former were exposed to more sunlight. And that is all about gathering and presenting data. Now let's go to the next step, analyzing data. Data analysis is the part where you put everything together. Based on trends or pattern of the experimental data and your observations, you try to make inferences and predictions. You also try to figure out what your results mean. To do this, you need to review all recorded data and observations. You need to look at the graphs or other tools you use to represent your gathered data. And now we reach the final step, drawing a generalization or conclusion. This is when the hypothesis is either accepted or rejected. If the conclusion means the hypothesis is rejected, then another hypothesis needs to be examined. 
If the hypothesis is accepted, then the explanation becomes a theory. In both cases, the conclusion should state all the findings so others can verify the results or explore some findings. So those are the scientific method that is used to solve problems scientifically. But who is behind these methods and what are the common attitudes among them that made them successful? The skills, values, or attitudes that are common among scientists include the following. Creative thinking. It is the ability to generate ideas and see the world in imaginative and different ways. Critical thinking. It is the ability to evaluate ideas and recognize the implications and practical consequences of given assumptions. Curiosity. It is the interest leading to inquiry intellectual honesty freedom from deceit and untruthfulness it is the ability to give credit to whom it is due humility it is the ability to accept one's strengths and limitations logic it is the ability to make inferences and see interrelationships of facts and events Objectivity, it is the ability to express or deal with facts or conditions as they are. Judging observations without being influenced by personal feelings, prejudices, or interpretations. Patience, it is steadfastness despite opposition, difficulty, or adversity. Perseverance, it is being persistent in an undertaking in spite of counter-influences and discouragement. Scientists contribute to society through their endeavors. They uncover hidden scientific knowledge which are then made useful through technology. Though some scientists make discoveries serendipitously, most of them spend many hours working in the laboratory or in the field in search for knowledge. They sometimes experience difficulties and frustrations in their scientific undertakings, but they persist nonetheless. Possessing positive attitudes and values help them succeed eventually, not only in their fields but also in life. In St. Nicholas Academy, we are living up with our goals to equip students with necessary knowledge and skills to develop satisfactorily. And by doing this, we are hoping to prepare our students in their success, not only in their careers but also in life. There you have it! That is all about the components of scientific investigation. To know how far you understand our lesson, Answer the following questions. This has been your science teacher, Ma'am Densi Ganados Lariba. If you have comments or suggestions, you can contact me in these numbers. Or, you can message me in my messenger. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned from our lesson.